the people of the West, known as Luceños today. Since time immemorial, the Ataxum lived in harmony with the land and were stewards of their natural environment. We honor their history and their continued presence in their native land and pay our respects to the Luceño as they continue to be a vital force in our region. Along with this effort of acknowledgement, we strive to develop a deeper understanding and appreciation for the Luceno people. Please now give your attention to Gary Mobach, who will offer our prelude to worship.
Thank you, Gary. Beautiful, beautiful, as always. Uh, welcome. Welcome to you who are worshiping with us here in person at Pilgrim United Church of Christ in Carlsbad, California. Carlsbad by the sea, as we like to say. And welcome to you who are worshiping with us on Zoom, most of you who are our members, and those of you who are worshiping with us on Facebook and YouTube Live. We are so glad that you are spending this time with us. Uh, just a few announcements before we get uh, underway. Uh, first of all, um, we have our Good Samaritan offering for the month of April will go to get on the bus. Uh, the pandemic is over and we're going back to the women's prison this year for Mother's Day. And our volunteers from Pilgrim organize the families of those mothers who are incarcerated so that their children can visit them. And you know, it's not an easy thing. It takes a lot of paperwork, it takes a lot of organization, uh, and so, and it also takes the expense of renting the bus and carrying these families from all over Southern California on a seven hour drive to visit their mothers on Mother's Day weekend. So please be generous to the uh, Good Samaritan offering for Get on the Bus. Also on next Sunday, our environmental team is sponsoring a Trading Post Treasures and they want you to come and participate by bringing things that you can exchange. It's kind of like a swap meet, but no money. It's a way of not filling our landfills with junk. There's stuff that I have that you might use and stuff that you have that I might use. So come next week, all the details are in your bulletin. Also, we would like to recognize all of the April birthdays. If you have an April birthday, would you please stand? Oh my goodness, amen. All the April birthdays, let us sing. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear pilgrims, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. You can sit down. Okay. <laughs> and now we'd like to recognize any visitors who are with us today. Uh, if you are visiting our church today, please stand. We just want to see who you are. Welcome, welcome back, our Minnesota snowbirds. Oh, and we have two other visitors. Now, remain standing, remain standing, because now we're all going to stand. And if you're sitting next to one of our visitors, please reach over and make them feel welcome as we greet one another in Christian love. Join in. Before uh, Steve comes to lead our worship, I uh, just want to make an announcement. Donna Durlam, please see Donna. She has her estate moving sale uh, today, and uh, she'd love for you to come by and take some stuff or buy some stuff. And at the end of the sale, it will be uh, kind of a distribution. But see Donna. Raise your hand, Donna. Uh, <laughs> because everything has to go. I'm moving and 
Yeah. 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 So what I need tonight by the clock is people to help me put it in boxes because everything that's in there for you on this issue is going to yeah. the two donation places that will take up the money. Okay, and Don is right down the street at 3384 Monroe Street, apartment B. So please uh, help her out today. Yes. And good morning. Good morning. I'm Steve Pocock. I'll be your litter just today. Would you please join me in the congregational affirmation? We are an open and affirming community within the United Church of Christ with a progressive theology, a commitment to spiritual growth, and a passion for social justice. And now, the call to community. Huddled in fear, locked away from the world, the words of Jesus pierce the room. What do we hope to hear in this room on this day? Peace, peace, peace. And now for all of those who are able to stand and everybody else, you can sit and please join us in singing the morning hymn number 172, Jesus Call Us Over the Tumult. All right, all the children come forward for children's sharing time. You sit right there, front row. Not yet, not yet. See you looking. <laughs> there we go. Man, we need, we can go to the back seats here if we need to. Overflow in the front row, love it. All right. Hey, good to see you all today. So I have a little story, and shockingly, it comes from the life of Jesus. Who could have thought of such a thing? Jesus on a Sunday morning at church. Anyways, Jesus had a bunch of friends he called the what? Disciples, right? He had a group of people that were following him. They were learning from him. They were doing everything he did, visiting the people that he visited. They did everything together, right? So he was teaching them how to love and how to be better people. He sent them on a mission. And he says, go into all of Israel and tell people about what we're doing. Act like I do, speak like I do, live like I do. That's like me telling you to go into the United States. But you can only talk to people who look like you 
And you can only talk to people who think like you, the same religion as you are. It's very limited, right? Very exclusive thing. By the end of Jesus' life, though, he tells his disciples, go into all the world. He says, go into all the world. Not just Israel anymore, the world. What changed between that? Why all of a sudden is he saying, this is bigger? I'll tell you. He met a woman. <laughs> he met a woman, and this woman had a daughter. <laughs> That's right. This woman had a daughter who was sick. And she says, Jesus, please heal my daughter. And he says, no, you're not an Israelite. She was a Samaritan. They didn't like each other. And she said, she was insistent. She proceeded to try and get Jesus to heal his daughter. And Jesus was so amazed and so moved by her faith that he's like, you know what? I will. And as a matter of fact, you're going to change my mind about the whole way I look at the world. So this woman who looked different, worshiped different, lived different than Jesus, he says, you're, one of, you're, you're my sibling. I love you just like I love everybody else. And because of that woman, Jesus says, I want everybody in this world to hear. Everybody in this world needs to experience the love that you experience. And so that's called the Great Commission, right? You're going to hear a little bit more about that. But here's what I want you to remember. As you go into your world whether it be school, practice, lessons, church. As you go into your world, don't just love the people that look like you or dress like you or think like you, but love everybody, despite of how they look or what you think of them. Does that make sense? Cool. Well, in that case, everybody can stand and go into your world of Sunday school. <laughs> Nicely done, Josh. Will you now join me in the unison prayer of confession? God, we confess that we too might be like Thomas. As we are overwhelmed by the world's grief, it's natural for us to be cynical. It's hard to believe that hope is possible when hope is hard to find. But when we stop believing in hope, we also stop believing liberation can be possible. When we stop working to tear down injustice and discrimination, we stop others from experiencing the peace we have found in you. Forgive our unbelief, calm our fears, and help us be instruments of your peace. Amen. In the assurance of pardon, beloved, Jesus comes to us with grace, telling us we can believe. Because we believe, we can also be empowered to do the work of justice. Now each week, we spend a few moments in meditation, started with this bell. Allow the tone to filter into your consciousness and <clears throat> try and see whether you can get in touch with something other than what you were thinking about when you came in the church.
The Gospels do not all agree on where Jesus first appeared to the disciples. Matthew and Mark say Galilee. John and Luke say Jerusalem. This shows that the Gospel writers had theological had a theological purpose in where they located Jesus' first appearance. This is evidence that these Gospels are not history, but theology. Each writer resurrects Jesus to serve their own theological perspective. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came to him, took hold of his feet, and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, where they will see me. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Welcome to the month of April. The Simon and Garfunkel song, April Comes, She Will, describes the temperamental and infatuation-prone love we, well, we've known in our youth. It's quite a contrast to agape, the love of God, which we share and which is forever. That's Peter. Oh, one other announcement. Uh, my granddaughter is still selling Girl Scout cookies. <laughs> no, I mean, actually, I got stuck with a box. Please save me from eating them all. There's a box on the patio. You can get them during coffee. And there's a voluntary donation, so anyway. 
like to speak just from the theme, now what? I'll say this first. Was Easter great? Easter was great. I tell you, I just wanted to stop. <laughs> let that be the last worship service, you know? Just let's, you can't top that. Just close up shop, that's it, go home. But uh, that's what made me think of the theme. Now what? I imagine the disciples might have felt a little bit like that. You know, they had the resurrection. Oh! And then Jesus ascends into the heavens, and they look at each other and they say, now what? <laughs> but as the story goes, you know, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee. And they had gone there on the instructions of the women, because they were the first ones at the tomb. So first the women, and then the men actually get to see Jesus. Easter is complete. Now what? Unfortunately, we don't really know what happened next. You know, the founder of the Jesus Seminar, uh, Robert Funk, in his book, Honest to Jesus, suggests that it might have been years before the followers of Jesus actually became a movement. You see, the words that Matthew writes, he didn't write until probably 90, year 90 of this common era. And Jesus was executed, crucified, probably around 30, 33. So that's 60 years after the actual events, Matthew writes these words. And Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. So when Matthew wrote those words, he was really looking back on a story that he had received because he wasn't there. But this oral tradition had been percolating throughout the Judea, uh, Palestinian, Mediterranean, even as far as Rome to the west, and even in Athens and Greece, this oral tradition had been percolating around. And so they knew something of what had happened, and Matthew, having gotten the Gospel of Mark, and also had found the source of sayings of Jesus, put it all together, and he thought he would do a better job than Mark. And so he wrote his own gospel, and he concluded it with what we have come to call the Great Commission. But Funk says, we don't really know what happened the day after Jesus was executed. History pretty well documents that Jesus lived and that Jesus was crucified by the Romans who, are, who were the occupying force of Judea at that time. There's no history to document the resurrection. The resurrection is a statement of faith. The resurrection is a theological assertion, not subject to historical investigation, but it was the way the church empowered itself to answer the question, now what? Now what is the resurrection? That was their answer to now what? Now, most scholars of Christian origins 
teach that those who devoted themselves to Rabbi Jesus, as he was known in his own lifetime, were and remained Jewish in their self-identity. Because as we know, Jesus was a Jew. Some people forget that. They think he was the first Christian. But Jesus was a Jew, and so were all those who first followed him. And they remained Jewish in their identity and were perceived as such by others. But to be a Jew was no simple thing. Judaism itself was not monolithic. It had splintered into several different movements, and including some very violent revolutionary movements like the Zealots, who had inherited you know, that Maccabean spirit you know, back uh, before the Maccabees had thrown out the, the Greeks and had set up a new kingdom 400 years after the kingdom of Solomon had been deposed and David had been deposed. And then they got thrown out. But so there was always this revolutionary spirit within Judaism. But there were a number of different ways of being Jewish. So being a violent zealot was one. Being a scholarly uh, scribe was another. Being a pietistic Pharisee was another. And being a follower of Rabbi Jesus was yet another. So just to say they were Jewish doesn't tell you the whole story. Judaism was part of a, this volatile moment in Roman and Jewish history. And the passage for today is one of several alternative endings to the Jesus story. The first ending to the Jesus story was that he was crucified, dead, and buried on the third day, and he rose from the dead and would return in power and establish the empire of God. This first ending envisioned Jesus coming back as a kind of Messiah, a Davidic hero who would obliterate the Roman Empire and reestablish the kingdom of Israel. There were sects of people within Judaism that were looking for such a Messiah. And some of them thought, because of the, 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 the popularity that Jesus had gained, that maybe he was the one. Maybe he was the one. So the first story they told about Jesus was that, yes, he was crucified. Yes, he died. Yes, he was even buried. But on the third day, he rose from the dead, and he will return in power. So intense was the belief in the immediate return of Jesus that the Apostle Paul could write to the church in Corinth and advise the followers about the Christian life. You know, as I've said repeatedly, and I think we really need to hear it over and over again to truly understand, this, this, this Jesus way of life and before they were called Christians, they were simply called people of the way, the way of Jesus. These Jewish folks kind of understood what Jewish life was supposed to be about, what its, what its guardrails were, what its rules were, what its diet was. They knew how to be Jewish, and being a follower of Jesus didn't change a lot about how they lived in the world. But when this faith, when this movement spread beyond the Jewish community and into the Greco-Roman world, well, this was quite a different thing. Because as we know, they were not familiar with the Jewish way of life. They were worshipers of different gods within the Greco-Roman pantheon. They worshiped Apollo, they worshiped Jupiter, they worshiped Aphrodite, they worshiped Venus, they worshiped Diana, they worshiped Bacchus, they worshiped all these different, they worshiped in all of these different temples. And so some of them were now attracted to this Jesus movement and they didn't know how to live a Christian life. 
And so they said to Paul, who was the founder of many of these congregations, what now does it mean for us to live as Christians? We've got all these questions and we don't know the answer. So most of the correspondence that Paul wrote to the different congregations that he had established and some that he didn't, all those letters to Corinth, to Galatia, to Thessaloniki, these were letters answering questions that they had about what this Christian life was about. So Paul's belief in the immediate return of Jesus was so intense that when the Corinthians asked him about married life, should we even get married? Paul was able to write this. He advised the followers there in Corinth not to get married. He advised them not to get married because in his view of this imminent end of life as we know it, all human institutions would become irrelevant in the new empire of God. And earthly practices like marriage would just get in the way of devoting oneself fully to God. Listen to what he actually wrote in his letter to the church in Corinth. Quote, I think that in view of the impending crisis, it is well for you to remain as you are. Are you bound to a wife? Interesting choice of words, isn't it? Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Do not seek a wife. So are, are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. Those who marry will experience distress in this life, and I would spare you that. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious only about the affairs of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about the affairs of the world, how to please his wife. And his interests are divided. Don't go to Paul for marriage counseling. So, so what did he mean by being anxious, concerned, I would translate it, about the affairs of the Lord? Now, here is where I see some overlap between the Gospel of Matthew and the letters of Paul. In our passage today, the bottom line is this. After stripping away all the institutional gobbledygook about authority in that closing passage. The gist of it is this. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you and remember I am with you always to the end of the age. So much is accomplished in this short paragraph. First of all, this business about all nations shows that the mission to the Gentiles that had become Paul's focus had ultimately prevailed. You know, as I mentioned, this started as a Jewish movement, but there was always, even within Judaism, what they called um, God-fearers. And these were Gentiles, and Gentiles simply means people from everywhere else. You were either Jewish or you were other. But, but there were people who were always attracted to this Jewish faith, and they were very devoted to the Jewish way of life, and they wanted to be Jewish, except for the men, they couldn't quite get down with circumcision. <laughs> and so they kind of remained on the outside and they were considered God-fearers 
but not quite Jewish. Because coming to the faith as an adult, it's quite a different thing than <laughs> being born and the eighth day when you don't even remember. But this passage here shows that those God-fearers who were attracted to Judaism now saw in this Christian movement a way of being full members. Because remember, Paul's great contribution to the world was his saying, you don't have to become Jewish in order to become a follower of Jesus. That break in the continuity was key to the expansion of the Christian message and movement throughout the world. Without that theological innovation, we'd all be Jewish. Or we wouldn't be here. We'd still be worshiping Bacchus. Yeah. So this is evidence that by the time, because Paul was writing in the 50s, the 40s and 50s, Matthew isn't writing until the 90s. So between Paul and Matthew, the movement had expanded to all the nations, to all the Gentiles. So that's the first thing that this paragraph accomplishes. The second is baptism. Baptism in the name of Jesus was the mark of those who were part of the movement and believed that baptism conferred on the one baptized the Holy Spirit. And it was the Holy Spirit that was the ultimate animating force and power, the very connective tissue of this emerging Christian movement. So it was baptism that distinguished those Jewish Christians from the Jewish folk. And then it was baptism that brought the Gentiles into this Jewish Christian movement. And that was Paul's argument. If they're baptized, they don't need circumcision because baptism is what we are now offering. The Holy Spirit was the animating power and the connective tissue of this emerging Christian movement. And the, this was necessary, this kind of bonding element was necessary because at this early stage, there was not a clear distinction between who was Jewish and who was a Christian Jew or a Gentile Christian. Now, the essential points of this passage were two things. One, teaching them to obey the teachings of Jesus. Remember, it said, teach what I've commanded you. So the first thing was teach them to obey the teachings of Jesus. And the second thing it says was to wait for Jesus' return. That's why it says, well, I'm sorry, I misread that. The second thing it accomplished was that the waiting for Jesus' return was over. Paul was looking for the immediate return of Jesus. By the time you get to Matthew, they were no longer waiting. And they, they instituted what they call a realized eschatology. Meaning, you know what? We're tired of waiting for Jesus, so we're just going to say, he's back! And that's what the Holy Spirit was. It was Jesus' return. That was the way they theologically rationalized how you move on from this sitting and waiting for something that for 50 years now, between Paul and Matthew, had not happened. And their way of getting around that, of negotiating that little problem, was simply to say, Jesus said, when he ascended, I am with you always. So nothing to wait for, no return. I'm already here. No more waiting around for Jesus to return, as Paul had suggested. But the resurrection appearances that we read about in the Gospels 
were intended to fulfill that expectation of the return of Jesus. And now the followers of Jesus were to spread the empire of God throughout the known world and make disciples of all nations. No longer just the Israelites, but all nations are invited into this new movement. So where does that leave us? We're here 2,000 years later, and we still have the same mission. Our mission, the reason that we are gathered here at Pilgrim Church, is to teach the teachings of Jesus to a world in desperate need of peace, of love, of compassion, and of hope. The mission hasn't changed. If we who gather here believe that we encounter something that enhances our lives, that allows us to be anxious about the things of God and less anxious about our own lives and our own needs and our own wants, then the natural consequence of our experience is to share it with others who are anxious about the world. I think if we ran out of here today and said, we've got the answer to your anxiety, <laughs> that we could fill this place, put down your Xanax and take up Jesus. <laughs> Just like the Christians who were reading the Gospel of Matthew, not so much the early letters of Paul, we are not looking for some cataclysmic consummation of the world as we know it. And we're not looking for Jesus to come riding on the clouds like Jesus Cowboy. Ha! We are not looking for that. No, we are here with Matthew. Our vision is that Jesus is here with us, that we are the body of Christ. And therefore, it is up to us to teach the world the teachings of Jesus. And what did he teach? Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you. Anybody in here ever been hated or excluded? I know some of us have. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. For surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But Jesus says, this is the Bible, y'all. Woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. So it's up to us to teach the world the teachings of Jesus. Oh, and there's another one here. Love your neighbors as yourselves. It's up to us to teach the world that love. It's up to us to teach that Jesus said, what Jesus says to the world. He also said something else, love your enemies. Now, that's one we even don't like to hear. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. 
If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those, now listen to this now. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even MAGA Republicans love those who love them. That's what it says. No, it actually says sinners, but. <laughs> if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even MAGA Republicans do the same. Ouch. That's our charge. This is what we've come here to learn and to teach. And so I challenge you. I challenge you who want a world that Jesus would bless, that we cannot build that world by ourselves. There are simply not enough of us. If you want that world, then we have to do the work. And part of that work is teaching others. Now you say, well, I'm not a teacher, I'm not a theologian, a and you might be correct, but that's what you called me for. My actual title in the terms of call is pastor and teacher. But you have to bring the students. You who claim that another world is possible have to bring those who are not building that possibility into earshot of the words and way of Jesus. If we believe that the way of Jesus offers hope for a peaceful, prosperous, and loving world, we cannot sit here by ourselves and complain that others are creating a world of greed, hatred, fascism, homophobia, misogyny, and white supremacy and not reach out to them or to others to show them that another world, another way is possible. So that's what Easter is about. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive in us. So act like it. <laughs> the next episode in the Gospels after the Sermon on the Mount was Jesus going to a Roman soldier's home. It doesn't get any more MAGA than that. It's like Jesus going to a January 6th rioter's cell. <laughs> And he went there to that Roman centurion's home to heal his slave. That's what it says. And my point is that Jesus walked the walk. He didn't just love those who loved him. He went to those who were part of the occupying force and shared his love with them to heal, not free, to heal his slave. So we ought to take an example from Jesus, go and do likewise. We can't do it by ourselves. I challenge you to reach out and to let somebody else know that you even go to church. <laughs> Because just by letting people know that you go to church, somebody might ask you, well, what church do you go to? I'll tell you a short story and I'll be done. Uh, I am exhausted, <laughs> okay? I had quite a week. We had Easter, and then on Wednesday, uh, we, we had the memorial service for uh, Ted Hagee. After the memorial service, one reason you didn't see me hanging around is I went to catch a flight to Dallas, Texas, and then from Dallas, Texas, drove an hour out to the boondocks to perform the wedding of my niece, and then drove, flew back on Friday, and then I'm here this morning. But 
while I was in Dallas, another niece, virtually sister to the one I was marrying, pulled me aside and said, Uncle Madison, there's something I want to tell you. I came out as a lesbian last week. And I wanted to share that with you to know if it's okay, essentially. And of course, I shared with her, oh, we are an open and affirming church and all that that meant. And then she lives in Houston. I was able to go on the UCC website and to find an open and affirming church for her to attend in Houston, Texas, y'all. And I found several. And in fact, this one church that I looked at their website, I saw the pastor there, and I said, well, I got to find out who this guy is. So I Googled the pastor to find out whether he was, you know, what, what was it all about, and found out he was a graduate of Union Theological Seminary. So immediately I sent her the link to the website and said, this is the church that I want you to visit. My point is, because she knew I was a pastor of an open and affirming church, she felt free to come out to me. And all I'm saying to you is, there's somebody in your life, and you don't know who they are. I had no idea. No idea. But by her knowing that I go to this church, and by someone in your life knowing that you go to this church, you just might change their life. But if you put your lamp or your candle or your light under a bushel, they'll never see it. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Christ is risen in me and in you. Let the people of God say, Amen. Amen. The ushers will be <coughs> collecting your offering while we listen to special music. Will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for all the gifts that you shower upon us, our talents, our families, and this church. 
use this church as a place where we can practice the love that Jesus taught us so we can go out into the world and they'll see. Amen. On the first Sunday of every month, we celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion. Our communion table is an open table. Steve? Steve? Our communion table is an open table, meaning anyone can come to this table. We can't deny you access because it's not our table. It's Jesus' table. And so the invitation is to everyone. And this ritual, this liturgy, this sacrament connects us to the most ancient practice of the early Christian community. You may come to the table or you may remain in your seat. If you remain in your seat, we have from the usher the pre-filled cups and just simply raise your hand and he'll provide you with one for you to commune in your seat. So I invite you all to stand and to pass the peace to one another with these words, the peace of God be with you. Peace of God be with you. Okay. You may be seated. We return to the table that we abandoned four years ago. We abandon the table in fear. We return to the table in love. We gather as just a part of our broader community, as a symbol of that whole. We gather here for those, we gather here at the table for those who remain in the pews. We gather here for those who are at home. We gather for those for whom it is not safe to gather. We gather for those who have lost the habit. We gather for those who have found us for the first time because we were online. We gather to share bread and cup. We gather at the table that Jesus has set. Let us pray together. If you'll pray the prayer of Jesus with me. O divine divine creator, Holy are you, your empire come, your will done, so in all the earth we might know heaven. Give us a meal just for today. Forgive us as we forgive others. Lead us away from testing and deliver us when we face evil. You are forever. Amen. We give thanks to the one who is the source of life and love. We give thanks that the divine presence permeates human history and cosmic reality. The divine is a presence heard in a baby's cry and an elder's wail. The divine is a reality known in the prophet's proclamation and the protester's sign. You are a sign of hope that has been seen and known through the thin places of our lives and in the lives lives of those through whom you have chosen to reveal yourself. Reveal yourself, O God, in this bread. Reveal yourself in this cup. Reveal yourself in our lives as you did in the life of Jesus of Nazareth, that others might find their way to you, to love. Spirit of life and love, from you we draw strength in the face of challenge and hope in our confrontation with hate. Together, betrayed, we turn the other cheek of friendship. Attacked, we walk the extra mile of nonviolence whatever the price, 
for truth demands a sacrifice, and the way of Jesus is narrow but straight. So now let this morsel and this sip give us holy power to be love in the world and to follow the life of Jesus that leads us to true life in you. Bountiful God, we give you thanks. I'm sorry, back to my liturgy here. We break this bread, the bread of blessing, and we pour this cup, the cup of hope. We invite you now to come to the table and to share the bread and the cup through in tincture. You'll take the bread and you'll dip it in the cup and then you'll consume it. And we'll all gather here around the table and once we all gather, then we shall share. So please come as the ushers direct you to this table. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Christ is risen in me. Go in peace and may the God of peace go with you. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Christ is risen in me. Go in peace and may the God of peace go with you. Come, come, there's plenty of good room. Come until the table is full. The bread of blessing, the cup of hope. Take and eat, take and drink. say Christ is risen Christ is risen indeed Christ is risen in me go in peace and may the God of peace go with you
Christ. Come to, we got plenty of good room. The bread of blessing, the cup of hope. Take and eat, take and drink. And turn to your neighbor and say, Christ is risen indeed. Christ is risen in me. Amen. Now go in peace, and may the God of peace go with you. Take and eat, take and drink. That's gluten free. Turn to your neighbor and say, Christ is risen indeed. Christ is risen in me. Now go in peace, and may the God of peace go with you. The crackers on the plate are gluten-free for those of you who require that or prefer that. All right. The bread of blessing, the cup of hope. Take and eat, take and drink. to your neighbor and say, Christ is risen indeed. Christ is risen in me. I'm going peace, and may the God of peace go with you. together the prayer of thanksgiving. Bountiful God, we give you thanks that you have refreshed us at your table by granting us the assurance of your blessing and the reality of your joy. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and send us forth into the world in courage and peace, rejoicing in the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. And now receive the benediction. Peace be unto you. Go into all the world and let them know that another world is possible in Christ. Amen. <laughs>